In previous videos, we interviewed Arthur Jacob, a PhD student in mathematics at TPFL. Arthur described how he analyzed neural networks from a functional perspective. Interestingly, by considering that the initialization of a neural network is a sampling of a prior distribution on functions, we can then try to analyze neural network learning in Bayesian terms. At initialization, it it's because the parameters are random, the function will be random, and actually in the infinite width limit, it's a Gaussian process. It okay, what's a Gaussian process? Well, a random function corresponds to a Gaussian process if for a random function and... Any set of points, and you look at the... You take the vector of values of the function on those points, it will be a multivariate Gaussian vector. In particular, any particular value of the random function will correspond to a normal distribution. Plus, there will be easy to describe correlations between the values of the function at different points. In any case, now we can study the learning phase, which, as we discussed in a previous video, basically corresponds to a gradient descent of the so-called neural tangent kernel. And for quadratic losses, the evolution of the learned function is even more nicely described as it now corresponds to a linear differential equation. Because it's a linear differential equation, and we know that at initializations the, the network has a Gaussian distribution, so it's a Gaussian process, we, can, we know that actually the, the distribution uh, of the um, function at all time steps will be Gaussian too, and we can predict it, the, the mean and, uh, and variance. In particular, for a given initialization, the learning of the function is perfectly deterministic. Uh, once we know the, the initial value of the function, actually its trajectory during training is very fixed. In the infinite width limit, there's no more randomness. So the only randomness is due to the initialization, the, the function at initialization. Now, given that, what's interesting to imagine is to think of all possible initialization and to see them evolving through learning and converging. And at first, I thought that all functions would converge to the same learned function. No, actually, it's really at, at the end, because, I, I, um, because at initialization, you, you get something that looks like a posterior distribution, but at, at convergence, actually because uh, at first you have uh, this uh, random, and uh, the variance of the distribution doesn't go to zero, actually. It, go to zero? it goes to zero on the data points, because of course you will need to, you converge to the minimum. So the minimum is when you go exactly through the, the points that you have set for your, uh, for your regression. But actually between those points, the, it's still random due to the randomness at initialization. Okay, when Arthur told me that, I was then guessing that the distribution of functions after learning would correspond to the posterior distribution of the functions, assuming random initialization and given the training data set. Well, actually, it's not exactly that. It's a, it's a pity because it just, it's not exactly works because actually at initialization, the, 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 it's a Gaussian process, the function and it's Gaussian process with covariance given by a kernel which we call the, some, the kernel sigma, and, uh, which has already been studied. And it's really related to the neural tangent kernel, but it's, it's a bit different. Actually, the, the neural tangent kernel is the kernel sigma plus a lot of other terms. So, so it's, a bit, it's a kind of bigger kernel, like it's a, it has bigger variance. The, it will represent a bigger variance, the, the neural tangent kernel. And um, actually, if instead of, if instead of initialization, initializing with sigma, we would initialize with the neural tangent kernel, then the distribution at convergence would be the posterior, would be, would be the posterior distribution. So actually, the, the distribution at the end, it, looks, it's really, it really looks like a posterior distribution, except that the variance is uh, smaller than uh, what you would actually get with the... Um, but you still get this kind of, um, uh, with the posterior, where, where, where the variance grows bigger if you are far away from any uh, data points and so on. It's just that I think you really would just would see a, a bigger variance if you, if, if with the real posterior. So unfortunately, gradient descent does not quite learn the Bayesian posterior. Sorry, Bayesians. But it's arguably close enough. You can really make an argument that neural networks kind of put a, a Gaussian prior on function with the neural tangent kernel uh, described by the neural tangent kernel. So. In Bayesian reasoning, um, I actually say I will compute this based on a prior. So I have some prior expectation before I collect any other information. Uh, and then 
all the in, every piece of information that I collect allows me to update this belief. The, the nice thing with the function space is that uh, the function of the parameters is not um, the symmetries of neural network when you swap two neurons. If you study the Hessian, for example, the parameters, it will change all your parameters and you, it will make it difficult to analyze what's happening because you have to take care of all these possible symmetries that could change a bit, uh, uh, make a rotation to, the, to your model. 